Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Welcome to the Monster Panel. I'm going to be your MC tonight. Hello. I know some faces out here. It's pretty cool. Um, so today we're going to be going over different monsters, and we have some different doctors with us that are going to come, kind of give some facts and myths and clear up some mystery about werewolves, vampires, zombies, biological monsters, artificial cranial modification, and the Green Rip Reaper. So, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Boston, Dr. Christine Boston. I'm that old. So before I jump into my presentation, I do want to survey the audience. How many of you believe aliens exist? Okay. I'm gonna be breaking some hearts. <laughs> So we actually have uh, quite a few individuals who do believe aliens exist, and one of the ideas and one of the um, pieces of evidence they utilize are these skulls that we find in antiquity of various different people around the globe who have these elongated skulls that seem to resemble H.R. Geiger's alien. Um, and for those of you who do not know H.R. Geiger, I'm really sorry, you're missing out on some great art, but if you've seen Sigourney Weaver's alien, he's the one who, de who uh, designed that alien. And as you can see, these kind of resemble H.R. Geiger's alien creature. And these are just three of countless other articles out there that feature this particular cranial style and use this as evidence to support this conspiracy theory that aliens existed, particularly in the past, and worked with ancient populations. But what exactly are these skulls? Is this really evidence of aliens? This is where I'm going to break your hearts. No. <laughs> Today's presentation is actually going to discuss what specifically this is. Uh, so this is close encounters of a different kind, artificial cranial modification, identity, and how it's not about aliens. <laughs> So artificial cranial modification quite simply is the manipulation of the cranial vault through the use of externally applied forces in order to change the natural form of the skull. Quite simply, it's just reshaping the skull from its natural form, natural shape. And there are two types. There's unintentional cranial modification, which is pictured on the left. This is caused uh, by all sorts of processes, sometimes accidents, uh, people who, you know, if you've ever had or interacted with an infant and been told you have to be really careful with the skull because that skull is very soft, uh, we see accidental cranial modification occurring from leaving the uh, infant lying on one side of the skull versus another instead of rotating it. Various different genetic conditions, such as Cruzon uh, syndrome, pictured here, um, also causes reshaping of the skull that is accidental or unintentional. But the primary uh, topic that I focus on, and focused on for my dissertation, and I'm going to focus on for today's presentation, is intentional cranial modification, which is the purposeful, intentional reshaping of the skull for a variety of different reasons. Now, artificial cranial modification, in particular intentional cranial modification, has been practiced for thousands of years. Actually, the earliest incidents uh, may have occurred with Neanderthals in the ninth millennia BC, but we do have definitive evidence of it occurring about two to 3,000 BC among archaic Homo sapien uh, groups. And it occurred all across the globe. We have a full range of different um, cultures from hunter-gatherer societies to state-level societies practicing artificial cranial modification on every single habitable continent. Please no, Antarctica has none because up until recently there were no humans and more penguin. There still are more penguins down there than are people. So how exactly was artificial cranial modification occurring? Um, what would happen is within hours, if not days after birth, a specific cranial modification device made up of boards, uh, cradle, textiles, rocks, uh, reeds, pretty much anything that was locally available would be affixed to the skull in a way to create a specific modification style. And this device would stay on the skull on average for three to five years, although we do have have some societies, particularly European groups, uh, leaving the device on up to 14 to 16 years. But we do know within three to five years, the permanent change to the skull was uh, done. And these are just some of the modification styles that exist out there. On the left, we have the two general styles that are pretty popular among all groups. Um, figure A is 
known as annular modification. That is where a modification device is put all around the skull, kind of like uh, this young lady's headband, oh. if I may oh. use you. Excellent fashion choice. Thank you for wearing it. Uh, <laughs> makes it easier for me. Uh, and it creates this bulbous shape, which you may uh, find a bit familiar because we do have some alien-like creatures that have this big bulbous uh, head. And then on a figure B on this left photo is that more is frontooccipital style, which indicates that the uh, modification device was put on the forehead and the very back of the skull to create this very elongated uh, Geiger alien-like shape, which probably is where we get this idea of these styles being related to aliens, even though, uh, uh, as I'll explain in a second, has nothing to do with them. But there are variations on the theme. If you see on this picture on the right, we have at least 15 different styles, potentially more, uh, various different uh, variations on those two primary themes. So why exactly was modification being practiced? Well, we have a lot of different uh, reasons for it, and they all did vary by culture. And we do have ethno-historic evidence to support a lot of these assertions. Um, anthropologists and clergymen who actually interacted with individuals still practicing artificial cranial modification um, got quite a few people who would say that they were doing this to make sure their children would be beautiful. Uh, there were actual uh, dictated uh, recordings of mothers crying when people told them they could not do this to their children anymore because they felt like they were dooming their children to be ugly and not be able to be successful in life. And not be successful, that meant not get married, not have children, not get a good job, not be successful in the society and culture. So beauty was a big factor, and that was actually very much the case for uh, your European groups and European gentry that did this. Uh, European nobility, gentry, and uh, various other Native American groups across North America also practice this as a marker of social status. If you were somebody of high status, you had your cranium modified. If you were somebody of low status or were of the slave class, you did not have your cranium modified. It was also used as an ethnic group indicator among South American groups, and this was in particular because there were very little biological differences among highland and lowland groups in the Andes, so they were using different modification styles to differentiate each, if differentiate each, each other. Sorry. Um, so if you were you know, wandering around on, in the desert or up in the Andes and you saw someone far away and you're like, hey, is that Uncle Bob? As soon as they turned and you know, showed the side of their skull, their profile, you're like, nope, that's not Uncle Bob, wrong head style. <laughs> uh, also, it was believed to instill personality characteristics. The ancient Maya believed by doing this, they were making people more intelligent. Uh, the Huns actually practiced cranial modification as a way of appearing and instilling ferocity into individuals, which uh, the appearance made people fear them, so it made them easier to conquer other people. And it also was the idea that by doing this, the people would automatically become more fearsome and more dangerous as well. And in some Asian groups, it was believed that this would actually ward off attacks from evil spirits. So by not modifying someone, someone was more prone to becoming possessed by a demonic uh, spirit. So what did it cause? I am a paleopathologist, um, and that was actually the primary area of my focus for my dissertation. And we actually have over a century's worth of study on this very topic. So we were very well versed in knowing what specifically it did and did not do. So it did cause a variety of not so positive um, situations, uh, conditions. Uh, first of which is premature suture fusion. Um, and I will explain that. What it is is your skull is actually made up of various different cranial bones. And when you're young, those bones are not connected. And as you grow up and get older, those bones uh, grow into each other and fuse when your uh, brain and skull is completely done growing. And um, what's happening with cranial modification is it's causing certain parts of the skull to fuse earlier, but leaves other areas to fuse much later in life. So it does compensate for itself. We also have cranial keeling, which is pointing shape, um, basically like a very pointy skull at the very top. If you've seen the movie Coneheads, then that's pretty much what that caused. Uh, endocranial shape changes. Uh, the inside of the skull is a very good mold for what your brain looks like. So it was actually causing um, changes on where the ves blood vessels were, the sinuses, all sorts of things like that. Uh, bone necrosis, which is actually related to skin ulcers, if the device was not taken off and the skin regularly cleaned, it could cause um, skin infections, which then could be spread to the bone. These were actually very, very minimal um, and oftentimes didn't occur that often, but it was something that could occur. 
Um, blindness was very, very rare, but as you can imagine, headaches were very, very common. What it did not cause, um, it did not cause anyone to lose their mental capacity, it did not cause any mental defects, it did not cause people to be less intelligent. Uh, that's actually been the most prevalent question asked, um, and despite a century's worth of questions and answers on that topic, we're still asking it and we still consistently demonstrate it does not cause uh, any deleterious effects on intelligence, and it doesn't cause death, which makes sense given the prevalence of this, um, of this cultural practice, because if it was, it wouldn't go on for thousands of years at the capacity it was going across the globe. So none of these effects were severe enough to actually stop any one group from practicing this. And we actually see cranial modification being practiced today, not to the extreme forms as I showed earlier, but we do have certain cultural groups here in the United States who still, who still practice this in some ways because they believe it's soothing the child. So in conclusion, just because you can't figure out how ancient civilization, civilizations built stuff doesn't mean they got help from aliens. <laughs> Thank you, Neil deGrasse Tyson, for that. Um, that's kind of the moral of the story here. We oftentimes see things in ancient populations we can't necessarily understand or explain, even though we have reasonable explanations in bioarchaeology and archaeological studies, but we're quick to assume that ancient populations couldn't have done this because we have this notion that they were primitive and unable to do so and didn't have the intelligence or the technology to do so, which is very prejudicial to those populations. But it's also very prejudicial to our own modern populations today because how many of us really want to admit that we're descended from a bunch of people who couldn't do things. <laughs> so you have to realize human beings are very, very creative, very, very intelligent, and have been for centuries. And these ancient populations, you know, they did some weird things, but they also did some really great things. And that's what led us to be such great humans today. So I thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. <laughs> Do we have any questions for Dr. Boston? Way to destroy the alien thing, right? You know, um, I'm not sure if this happened to me, but the back of my head is really flat. So I don't know if that was like something my mom did. I'm going to have to talk to her about it. Thank you so much for joining us. So we have a slight switch in uh, the program. Next, we're going to go ahead and welcome up um, Dr. Megan Gray. She's going to give a little talk about werewolves. But before we get started with that, I'd like to uh, thank the library committee for bringing this group of mad professors together. And uh, Thomas Kern's right over here, who is the lead on it. And I'm sorry, Karina, what's Why Windinger? I got it, right? Yeah. Karina Weininger, who put this whole thing together. Last year we did it again. It was a blast, and we hope to do it more in the future. So without further ado, Megan Gray. Hi. Um, can you guys hear me OK? Yeah? So I'm not used to standing in front of a podium, and my students that are here will know that it's very hard for me to stand still. <laughs> so I got to do it. Ugh. I want to move around. OK, um, yeah, so I'm Dr. Gray. I work in the biology department. Um, I'm a wildlife biologist by trade, so I study big animals, large mammals. That's what I did for my dissertation. And so I thought it'd be fun to talk about a large animal, a werewolf. Um, so I'll talk to you today about a hairy tail and um, do werewolves exist. And I guess my talk's also going to be kind of a bummer, because I'm going to disprove it, too. <laughs> it's, it's, we're scientists. That's what we do. OK. Um, so let's talk about uh, where lycanthropy came from. So lycanthropy is just another name for werewolfism. Uh, like stands for wolf and anthro for human. Uh, it's one of the oldest legends that we have in human history. In fact, there's Roman and Greek mythology related to it. Um, so a guy named Ovid wrote the Metamorphosis. And this was a, uh, a Roman myth where um, this king Lycaon, he had a visitor come to him one day, and he thought it was a god, so he killed his son and, and served the flesh of his son to this god. The god. This god was truly a god. This was Jupiter, and he was very upset by this, so he cursed King Lycaon to become a wolf for the rest of his life. And uh, that's kind of where all of this started. Um, in fact, most mythology surround, surrounding werewolves has to do with um, cursing them. And ever since then, it's really spread across the world. Um, so particularly, you guys, in the Middle Ages and Europe, um, with the rise of Christianity, we see a lot of myths and folklore surrounding werewolves. Um, they were associated with the devil. And if you guys can see in this picture, um, 
this werewolf is down here, mm -hmm. and he's eating a baby. Um, so that's apparently what they did back then. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's how they're depicted a lot, eating children. Um, which, by the way, children, if you're here, that doesn't happen, so don't worry. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, so you guys are probably all familiar with the witch trials. Well, there were also werewolf trials, so a lot of people were executed during this time because they were thought to have been werewolves. And this guy in particular, Peter Stump in Germany, he was actually executed, how funny is this, on Halloween night uh, in 1589. Um, he was tortured for quite a while and then he basically said he was a werewolf and that he had killed several people and consumed them after he had killed them. Um, but again, this was after he was tortured quite a bit before he made that confession. Um, so this is one of the famous stories. The reason why his name is Stump, which wasn't his real last name, was because he was missing his left hand. And people thought that meant he was a werewolf because when he was a wolf, it must have been caught in a trap and got cut off. So there was a lot of speculation that he was a werewolf and he uh, was executed for it. So the question is why? Why has this been so prevalent, this folklore, this myth? Well, we think that this was a way for a lot of people to explain serial killers or cannibalism. This was a way to explain this kind of odd psychotic behavior in humans. Um, this was also a way to explain wolf attacks. So you have to remember at the time, you guys, uh, wolf attacks were pretty prevalent. Um, they were associated with uh, being rabid, provoked. These guys are territorial. Um, there's a famous story, and this is true. <laughs> Uh, it's called The Wolves of Paris. In the winter of 1450, uh, Paris was starting to uh, build as a city, and they think they built it right in the middle of a wolf territory. So these wolves came in during the winter, and they started picking off the livestock. And then eventually they realized there was much easier prey in the city, which was humans. So they killed about 30 to 40 <laughs> human beings in the winter time. The problem with wolf attacks is that it doesn't end good for the wolves. So the people of Paris lured the, the, uh, the, um, the pack in one night and they stoned and stabbed them to death. So yeah, so, am I bumming everybody out? <laughs> Everybody's so quiet, okay. Uh, <laughs> but because I am a wildlife biologist, I have to put a plug in for wolves, you guys, because they are, those attacks are very rare. They don't happen very often. They avoid humans. They actually prefer large uh, hooved mammals, ungulates, compared to human beings. Um, and I have to say, we as humans are very fascinated with wolves, and likewise, wolves are very fascinated with us. Um, we actually think that wolves kind of almost domesticated themselves. They started hanging out with people um, before there was any type of uh, domestication on our part. And so we've had a long-term relationship with wolves for at least 50,000 years. We like our wolves. Okay, so how has the myth changed over the years? Well, there's lots of variation in the werewolf myth. Um, Early on, you guys, people thought that they had to wear a belt to become a werewolf or the skin of a wolf to become a werewolf. Um, there's lots of variation of the permanence, if you're a werewolf for the rest of your life or not. Um, but most myths, you guys, people still have some sort of human form when they change. Although if you guys are fans of uh, any of these, no. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my point is that the myth has evolved, okay, that's all. And so a lot of new uh, folklore, they actually just turn into a wolf. Um, the full moon thing is actually a recent addition to this mythology, so that didn't start, so being a wolf at full moon. And what's interesting is some cultures say if you drink the water from the footprint of an animal, you can turn into one. And so that's where some of this came from. So here are the key characteristics we will be looking for today. Uh, you got to be hairy. Is there... Anybody hairy? Yeah, a couple guys, okay. You gotta be wolf-like, you know, so you have to kind of keep some of your human characteristics. You have to be psychotic. You have to have very bad, extreme, agitated behavior, okay. Some of my students might think that's me sometimes. No? Good, okay. Uh, and uh, usually uh, this is transmitted through bites or scratch from a werewolf. So here's my, my pitch to you guys that well, this probably doesn't exist in real life. I'm sorry. Okay, so is this real? Are these monsters truly real? Well, let me talk about the full moon thing, okay? So lunacy, that term lunacy, lunatic, uh, that word comes from the Latin word for moon, luna. Um, so people think that people go crazy during full moons. By the way, I think we are having a full moon this weekend. Aren't we on Halloween? Yeah, okay. Oh boy. This is going to be a crazy weekend. Um, <laughs> so full moons have been associated with bipolar disorder, uh, insomnia, sleep deprivation. So I looked into the literature to see, well, 
Are people agitated? Do people do crazy things during full moons? And do dogs bite us more during full moons? Well, unfortunately, you guys, the data do not support this. Um, so this is just one graph to show you. These are the number of dog bites on full moon and non-full moon days. Um, and we control for the day of the week, and you can see there's absolutely no correlation between the moon phase and when dogs bite us. Dogs just tend to bite us more on the weekends because we hang out with them a little bit more on the weekends. Um, so unfortunately, you guys, uh, if you look at the literature, there's no relationship actually with human behavior, homicide, crime, or dog bites, and that's a pretty big misconception. Um, a lot of animals, including humans, do increase their activity during full moons, but they don't increase it to do any type of psychotic behavior. So okay, moons are definitely not the cause of being a werewolf. Well, what about being hairy, okay? And when I say hairy, these are hairy people, okay? So this is a true disorder in human beings. This is called hypertrichosis, um, and this is excessive hair growth. And as you can see, it's pretty excessive. Um, it is a rare genetic condition. In fact, there's only been 50 documented cases since the Middle Ages. So it do, we don't see a lot of humans. But the bottom um, over here, the bottom picture, that's actually a photograph of a, of a man that has hypertrichosis. Um, and you can see even to this day, these guys, these are the Gomez brothers. They live in Mexico. They are alive today, and they have this disorder. Um, the problem with hypertrichosis is it only explains hairiness. None of these men are psychotic that we know of or cause any crimes or anything like that. So unfortunately, it doesn't really cause any other symptoms of werewolfism. In fact, most people that develop this, they actually kind of use it. They are performers, exhibitionists. They perform in the circus. That's um, usually what they do instead of performing crimes. Okay, so hypertrichosis, not the cause of werewolfism. The last one is rabies, okay? So we've probably all heard of rabies. It is caused by a virus, and hey, it's transmitted through bites, through the saliva. It's held in the salivary glands. Um, so you get bit, you guys, and for about three to 12 weeks, that virus takes a nice uh, travel from where you were bit all the way up to your brain. And while it's in your brain, it reproduces, and then it spreads back down to your salivary glands so that you can bite someone else and spread it. So, so far, so good. This, this could be it, rabies, okay? Um, unfortunately, though, for humans, once you get it, if not treated, it's almost always fatal pretty quickly. Um, so here are some symptoms, flu-like symptoms. Okay, well, everything causes that. Um, how about this? Uh, <laughs> cerebral dysfunction, anxiety, confusion, agitation. So now we're starting to talk about kind of psychotic behavior, right? Hallucinations, delusion, insomnia. These are things that when people say they're werewolves, they say, hey, I don't remember when I was a werewolf. I was delusional. I had hallucinations. I think we're on to something here. Uh, hypersalivation, hydrophobia, difficulty swallowing. These are all rabies symptoms. So my question to you guys, <laughs> yes, can rabies turn you into a werewolf? <laughs> well, okay. Um, yes, while rabies has a lot of similar symptoms to being a werewolf, um, most attacks you guys on humans um, from different mammals come from like animals like bats or raccoons and not from dogs. But this might explain historically why people thought there were werewolves. Because maybe your friend, let's go to Uncle Bob again, you know, <laughs> maybe Uncle Bob got bit by something and a few weeks later, he's acting like a crazy man, right? And so for humans, maybe they explained it that way and maybe that's why this myth kind of grew. And in particular, you guys, any mammal can carry rabies. Um, and I'm sure in the Middle Ages, people were getting bit by things all of the time. Um, unfortunately though, or fortunately, with rabies, you don't get hair growth. So how do I get a werewolf, you guys? Well, I got to take someone with hypertrichosis and give them rabies. <laughs> That's the closest I'm going to get to a werewolf. And it still doesn't account for the transformation. So I still can't tell you how a human actually makes that transformation. Um, and unfortunately, if I give them rabies, they're going to die pretty quickly. And so really, we need a lot more mutations before we can become werewolves. So. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much. Any questions for Dr. Gray? Um, discussing lunacy, have you ever taken into account sundowning? 
So explain that. Sundowning is similar to Alzheimer's and dementia, where when the sun goes down, it causes a chemical reaction in the brain, causing you to have agitated symptoms, possible hallucinations, delusions. Um, actually, my grandmother has sundowning, so whenever oh. the sun goes down, she completely does like a 180 on her personality. Wow. She goes from this sweet, gentle little old lady to um, dark, depressed. Um, sometimes she doesn't know where she's at, so she'll just leave the house or she'll start like talking to people that aren't there and scratching at the walls. Wow, no, I have not heard of that. Um, damn it, I should put that in my talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that would explain some behavior, I'm sure, yeah, yeah. Interesting. I've not heard of that. Thank you. Fascinating. Any other questions for Dr. Gray? All right. Thanks. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much. How great was that? I mean, that kind of blows all my theories on walls, but that's okay. Um, so next up, we're going to have a biologist, another biologist, Dr. John Adlish, who's going to um, talk about flesh-eating bacteria, some of the scariest kind. Oh, you changed. Never mind. He is not going to talk about that at all. Um, so Dr. John Adlish, what did you change it to? <laughs> All right, so, oh, wow. Yeah, the people before me are. Okay. Can you hear me? All right, so, as John said. I'm a biologist. I'm a molecular biologist. When I'm not here, I work in the Amazon basin doing infectious disease. So, I'm going to talk. I don't have any werewolf stories or mummies or anything except that I can say my name is John and I'm a recovering werewolf. Other than that, <laughs> you know, I, I got to go with this stuff. So we live, where, what do we call Reno? The biggest little city. What about the biggest little monster? So what do you, what do you think the biggest little monster is? What's that? A Furby? Okay. Maybe it could be that guy, right? Well, is it this guy? So everything I'm going to show you is from my experiences. Um, could it be this guy? Is this monstrous? Could it be these guys? I don't know if you can. Uh, can I... uh, <laughs> this is a tarantula. Mm -hmm. That's a bat. So the tarantula is about the size of your dinner plate. So these are uh, the front ones up here. Yeah, you can see those, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they're pretty good. Everything the Amazon does. <laughs> so, uh, if it's not those guys, it could be this guy. Oh. 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 This, is, this is what I get to do on my start time. So what do you think it is? Well, the answer is this. Mosquito. Why are mosquitoes the biggest little monster? Because they suck your blood, and what else? They transfer blood containing many different things, like down here are some viruses. So we're going to talk a little bit about mosquitoes, and maybe Dr. Gray could answer the question, you know, what good are they when you see this? So when you look at mosquitoes, what we call them is vectors. So they transmit disease. And here are just, this is really, really a tiny list of the things transmitted by mosquitoes. We live in Nevada, in Nevada, in the desert, so I tell my students, this is a pretty sterile environment. We have 11 mosquitoes that basically move from one person's house to the next. But if you go to the Amazon basin, I mean, and even the people in Minnesota and Florida, they say, oh, we got mosquitoes there. No, it's nothing like the Amazon, trust me because there are so many animal populations and places for them to breed. So this is really just a small list of the things that they transmit. Malaria, 200 million cases a year, Whoa. over 600,000 deaths. Last year, there were about 660,000 deaths. The major majority of those deaths are in children. Mm -hmm. And so up to the age of four or five years old, those kids are more susceptible. Dengue fever, has anybody heard of dengue fever? Because this is kind of a new mosquito-borne uh, virus. 
and we have a hard time trying to, to get the numbers accurately, but it's about 50 to 60 million cases a year. So with dengue, I'm gonna talk a little bit about dengue and show you some of the effects. Something new that's come up, I think, you know, as a virologist, I kind of like this just because of the name, chikungunya. So when you look at chikungunya virus, we don't even know. We know that it's in the, in the tens of millions. This is kind of the newest virus that's been moving up from South America <laughs> up through, it's, and it's, it's coming here, it's already here, you know, in places uh, in North America. And then the latest one is uh, Zika virus which again, question marks because we have no clue. But this thing is really taking off. Zika virus is taking off so that it's going to be like dengue because it's transmitted by the same mosquito. Now leishmania down here, uh, this is actually a protozoan infection. So these are worldwide infections, 1.2 to 1.6 million cases a year. Yellow fever is another example. Even some worms can be transmitted, small worms can be transmitted by mosquitoes. So these guys, to me, are not really very nice, okay? Uh, this is what we call the Anopheles mosquito. Only female mosquitoes, by the way, only female mosquitoes will suck blood. So you don't get bitten by male mosquitoes because they're only good for one thing and then they're just tossed aside, guys. <laughs> so it's the female mosquitoes that have to get a blood meal to basically incubate their larvae. So they're, they're taking blood from all these different animal populations and acquiring these infections. But if we talk about malaria a little bit, uh, these are actually slides of, of, of patients that I've worked with. <coughs> I'm gonna step out here for a second. But if you look at these little circles right here, these are outside the red blood cells. These red blood cells are kind of agglutinated together because of proteins that the malaria parasite produces. We call it a lot. But these are, you notice these little rings out here. These are all over in this person's blood, which is indicative of a particular species of, of malaria. Now, they actually can go through sexual reproduction and they form what's called a zygote. This is called the, the banana gametocyte in malaria falciparum, so plasmodium falciparum. This is a, an in, this, you don't want to see this in your blood, by the way, because this is the worst type of malaria. This is the one that causes more deaths World worldwide than any other species of malaria. There are five now that infect human beings. Um, this is another one called Plasmodium vivax, which you can treat outpatient, on an outpatient basis, but you see all these little spores, little dots here, those are all what we call merozoites, which are part of that infection. So just to give you an idea of what, you know, someone who has malaria looks like, one of the, one of the hallmarks is jaundice. So you have liver problems because the organism goes to the liver, interferes with your metabolism, and you start turning yellow. She's yellow, she's actually supposed to be dark brown. And then you look at her eyes, and the sclera in her eyes are yellow. Um, this girl had vivax, and she was fine. But this is what happens when you get malaria falciparum. So this lady actually came down with cerebral malaria and succumb to the infection. And that's the one that we have a lot of problems with. If you get that type of malaria, that, that's a big problem. So what else, dengue fever. This is Aedes aegypti, which is a mosquito that transmits dengue fever along with a whole bunch of other things. This is an electron micrograph of dengue virus. So these viruses are extremely small. And like I said, with dengue, we're talking about 50 million cases a year worldwide. Now, out of that 50 million cases, slightly less than 1% will go into what we call dengue hemorrhagic fever, which is really difficult to treat. So this guy looks like, you know, he's just been out in the sun. Well, he's starting to hemorrhage everywhere. All of his capillaries are bursting, and he's beginning to hemorrhage, okay? This will get to the point where you become purple. I see people all the time that, that start to become purple. So this is a young lady that is recovering all these little white spots. We want to see these in clinical medicine because that shows us that the capillaries are starting to heal up. But um, if you see her like on my camera, she's pretty purple. And that's because all the capillaries have been bursting, okay? So massive fever. You start to bleed everywhere. You can bleed from your eyes, from your 
mouth, from, you know, you bleed in your skin everywhere. So this is what we call dengue hemorrhagic. But if we just go back to the numbers and we say 50 million cases, what is 1% of 50 million? Those, do we have any math people here? <laughs> so I, I guess it'd be somewhere around a half, a half a million, right? So that's a lot of people worldwide. And these are mostly poor countries where it's difficult to treat individuals that suffer from these infections. What else? Uh, leishmaniasis. Okay, now in, in clinical medicine, there's a lot of food descriptive terms, and so we call leishmania the lesions that occur as the result of leishmania, which is transmitted again by, by mosquitoes and sandflies, pizza-like lesions, okay? So this is the ulcer on, yeah. Thanks, John. <laughs> we have all sorts of stuff. We have like, you know, the cottage cheese appearance of lungs and tuberculosis and, you know, cancers that look like broccoli. Um, <laughs> Isn't this great? See, this is better than the, than the, you know, all those monsters that don't exist. Well, you know, what does leishmania cause? Lots of problems. We have several forms of this, but these are some people that, uh, this guy right here, you can see that this ulcer had gone all the way through his leg. I mean, it had gone into the bone, and he's recovering. This was a lady that came to me and one of my colleagues because she broke her foot. And she came in and, and I could just see a little bit of this raised margin right here on her, those little short pants. They're not quite shorts, but they're not pants that ladies wear, whatever they're called. Um, thank you, those, right. Yeah, I'm not a fashion consultant biologist or anything. But um, so, she, so I take her an x-ray and I look at her foot and she goes, well, how's my foot? I go, oh, your foot's fine. I mean, you broke, you, know, you broke one of your digits, but that'll, that'll heal. But this is what I'm concerned about, is leishmania. Because if you don't get these under control and the treatment is pretty difficult, then they spread and you get these massive lesions that lead to severe scarring and disfiguring. And in many cases, people die from this as well. So that's another problem that's transmitted by mosquitoes. Uh, as I told you, chikungunya, this, this is the, one of the newest things we have. So again, our estimates on the numbers of chikungunya, we are not quite sure. But as of April 15th, and this, this goes to these countries that are listed, Latin America, United States, we've had 1,398,788 suspected cases. So this is just our hemisphere. We haven't gotten into worldwide or into Asia attributed to this disease. Canada, the Mexico, uh, the Mexico, Canada, Mexico, have all recorded cases. They're all imported. But these mosquitoes are moving up to us as well. Chikungunya is kind of like dengue, but you don't get any sort of hemorrhagic condition. But the problem with chikungunya is that people that recover, 99% of the people recover, 99.9%. .9%, but it takes months because the severest form of this is really arthritis, and muscle pain to the point where you can't go to work. So think about your condition. Uh, maybe you're all wealthy enough that you could take six months off from work. And so you go to poor countries where they can't take six months off from work and they're trying to recover from these conditions where they can barely walk, they've got severe joint pain. So that's a big problem. Um, and then last, uh, last I have is a story, and, and I'm not advocating smoking by, by any means. Um, but I just have to tell you this story. So mosquitoes and things like sandflies can transmit other kinds of things. Okay, this is a particular worm that uh, one of our patients was bitten in the arm, and you know this is actually from a, a fly, but the fly injects the, the larvae of the worm in there, and then it grows into what's called a pupa. And so it's moving around in his arm, and to get it out, you know, what do you do? Well, this is really one of the monsters you want to worry about, right? So what do you do? We, we, we go in there, and we don't want to cut open his arm because he had two of them, and we don't want to cut his arm open. But one of my friends who's a pathologist, and he grew up in the jungle, says, uh, you know, there's this ancient tradition of, that people have passed down for 5,000 years that if you blow cigarette smoke, if we just put a little hole there and we blow cigarette smoke in there, then the worm will come up and we can catch it. Because this, this poor guy, we tried everything possible short of just you know, cutting his arm open to do surgery and pull the worms out. 
including injecting lots of chemicals and substances. And the, every time we did that, the worm would go closer to the bone, and that's, that's the problem. So, so my buddy Carlos says, you know, uh, I just happened to have a pack of cigarettes in my desk. I was like, I thought, I thought you quit smoking. Oh, yeah, they've been sitting there for a while. All right, so what we did was take plastic wrap, wrap his arm, cut a little hole in there, and then Carlos would start blowing the smoke in there. And it didn't come up, but you can see the worm would get agitated. So what he did was he, he smoked another cigarette and concentrated the, the, you know, the nicotine powder in his hand. And then we took that nicotine, you know, uh, like precipitate, and put it on the wound. And that agitated the worm enough so that it came up and we could just pull it out. And we did that with two of them, okay? So that's the only time I say, you know, smoking could be beneficial for your health, okay? <laughs> Uh, so that's my story on mosquitoes, the biggest little monsters. And thank you very much. Any questions? No? Okay. Thank you. Okay, who wants a cigarette? <laughs> Dirty little blood suckers. That's just gross. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Adlish. Next up, we're going to have... Dr. Hugh Frazier speaking about vampires, something that you guys might have actually been like, oh, I want to know more about Dracula and, and those dirty little bloodsuckers. <laughs> well, besides mosquitoes, we have myths about vampires. Please welcome Dr. Hugh Frazier. Good afternoon. <laughs> Count Dracula has sent me here to speak on his behalf. How many people here believe in vampires? <laughs> this is amazing. Do you know vampires exist? They're amongst us? And let me exp and you probably know one. Here it is. The original idea of a vampire is anybody who sucks the psychic energy from you, like your husband, <laughs> your girlfriend your fiance, or even just a friend. So if you are around people and you feel you're losing energy and you're being depleted, you are in the presence of a vampire, okay? Now, modern medicine has a different name for it, but the bottom line is that's what a vampire does. Now, the, the vampire from fiction, of course, is the one who sucks the blood from somebody. Do you know how that got started? It got started from a biblical quote that said, for the blood is the life. And so the fiction writers of vampires took that quote from the Bible and integrated it into their story about vampires. Now, let's talk just a brief, how, why is the vampire myth more powerful than any of the other myths or monster myths? And the reason is, is because it is actually part of history. You go to China, India, Egypt, ancient Rome, ancient Greece, entire European continent, London, whatever. And there are myths, superstitions, legends, and myths about vampires. So the whole idea of the vampire became part of history itself. And so because it became part of history, it became easier to believe, okay? And here are some of the reasons uh, the vampire myths got started. One in seven people, up to about 19, say, 39, maybe a little earlier, died of tuberculosis. Tuberculosis was a disease where you literally were consumed, your energy was drained from you, you looked pallid and pale. And so like all civilizations, they use mythology to explain something. In other words, if somebody is dying from something and you don't know why, right, you have to come up with a reason. And so one of the reasons uh, civilization came up with was the fact that this person has been, was bitten by a vampire. That's why they were dying. So you can imagine if you have a tuberculosis epidemic 
where thousands and thousands and thousands of people are dying, right? And somebody comes along and says, I know why they're dying. They're dying because they were bit by a vampire. And so that just makes the legend and the myth of the vampire grow exponentially, okay? Then other things happen. How many in here, how many in here have a tattoo? Hmm, it's a good thing that you are not living in the 1700s because you would be executed along with the witches and the werewolves and everybody else because they looked for strange markings on people. Funny belly buttons, little birthmarks, anything like that, they would suspect you of being something other than normal. And one of the, one of the themes that was out throughout society was the vampire theme. So if you had little markings like that, you could be considered a vampire, especially if you were a female. Anybody that fought with the devil, that could be considered a vampire. Because Dracul means vampire, it means devil. And so what happened is, furthering the myth of the vampire was the church, the Catholic church, who sent priests out into the wilderness, into the hamlets, into the cities, to find vampires and kill them. And so that spread the myth of the vampire. But they just didn't go out looking for them willy-nilly, they went out with vampire hunting kits. And they were little boxes like this. And as you opened them up, there was a crucifix, silver, of course. There was a rope. There was holy water, a mallet, and a stake to pound the stake into the vampire. You probably don't even know the final scene in the book Dracula. But this is how Dracula died in the final scene of the book Dracula by Bram Stoker. They had finally got vamp they had finally captured uh, Dracula on the top of Gorgo Pass in Middle Europe. And the sun was just starting to come up. Meaning what? Meaning the vampire was going to gain strength, right? And immortality. And v Dracula was smiling at the people who had captured him. And they stood over him. One had a, what they call a dagger, um, and another one had a knife. And what they did simultaneously to Dracula, they slit his throat and they drove the knife into his heart, and he died. But before he died, he died with a peaceful look on his face because he was so happy not to be Dracula anymore. And then he turned to dust. But that was in the final scene of the, of the story of Dracula, which I, if you, are a Drac if you are into vampires, I suggest you read the book. Anybody here read the book? Yeah, it's a great book. It's, it's really good. And uh, Bram Stoker, who was the author, took all these myths, all these legends, everything he could from folklore, everything he could from superstition, and he built it into the book to make the character seem real and believable. And he was real and believable to the people of that time in Victorian England because the history of vampires and the legends of vampires were still very real. People still believed in them. I was watching a, uh, a uh, TV show and they showed a funeral in Middle Europe, took place in the 70s, late 60s, 70s. And what, what it was is, a woman had died, they buried her six inches below the surface of the earth, then they went off to the church to hold the ceremonies, and then four people went back to the grave to dig her up because they thought she had been bitten by a vampire. And what they normally do in that case is a couple of things. They maybe cut the head off and stick it to the side uh, or stuff the mouth full of garlic or put, uh, holy hosts around the, the, the coffin and bury it 10, 12 feet to, below the surface of the earth. This happened in the 19, late 60s. So some of these legends die hard, very, very much so. I was talking to somebody just before the talk and I was asking her, she was from that area, and that they were gonna build a Dracula theme park, like Disneyland. 
because uh, they wanted to play off the legend. As far as I know, it hasn't, that hasn't been uh, built yet, but in some of the bars, they serve plum juice, which is supposed to be blood, to keep the legend going. Um, the whole thing started in 1428 when a fellow named Vlad Dracul was born. That's the legendary character that they built Dracula off of. Then there became something called vamp vampire hysteria in the 1600s. I mean, literally, people were going nuts. They thought vampires were running all over the place. And then there was, there was, a, there was a breakout of vampire hysteria in Russia that was huge. I mean, literally, thousands of people believed this. Um, not like Halloween here. This was the real McCoy. They really believed it. Um, the first vampire story was published in 1800. Uh, and then Bram Stoker came along and created the book Dracula in 1847. And then there were other famous authors that wrote vampire stories. And they were written in a lot of different ways. They weren't all about, you know, somebody sucking the blood out of somebody. There were th stories where a guy, a person could sit and sketch somebody before they died. They'd sketch things out. Like there was this one story where this young couple had just gotten married, were on this beach and they were having a good time, and they were enjoying their wedding and all that, and this guy in his black outfit, sort of vampirish looking guy, he was sketching a picture of her. And then what happened, of course, as soon as he finished sketching it, bingo, the uh, poor young woman died. So there were a lot of different kinds of stories, very, very good stories, as a matter of fact. Um, comic books were banned in 1954, you could not write a comic book about Dracula or a vampire. Then the comic book code changed uh, in 1971. And right after 1971, Marvel Comics started creating uh, comic books about vampires. Okay, this one was in 1979. And the pictures in this thing are awesome. I mean, the, 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 the drawings by the artists and stuff are unbelievable. And, they can, and vampires make really good subjects for uh, artwork and stuff. Um, Universal Studios created, you know, the vampire movie Dracula starring Bela Lugosi in 1939. You know, it's really interesting is you, 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 we, because we do this now, only we have Facebook and Twitter and all these other accounts where we can communicate with people. But when uh, Bela Lugosi played Dracula in that 1931, uh, actually 1931 movie, 91% of the letters that went to Bela Lugosi were from females. The other 9% were from scientists and priests. And they were asking Bela Lugosi as if he knew he was just an actor. He wasn't Dracula. But they were asking him, did he believe in all these myths about, you know, astral travel, uh, theosophy, spiritualism, all the kinds of things that were going on at that time. And they would ask him these questions and want, wanted him to write back. So all these things, the movies, the comic books, the stories, just keeps perpetuating the, the uh, vampire legend. Now... Just as a couple things that are of interest, uh, what kills a vampire? Now, this is the standard stuff that kills them. Today, everything kills them. They got all kinds of ideas. I saw this one uh, vampire movie where the deal was is um, they had a Jeep with a wench on the front, and they'd drive the Jeep up to a building, and then two vampire hunters would run inside the building, take the wench, attach it to the vampires, and then they'd start the wench and they'd pull the vampire out of the building into the sunlight where he would just explode. So, you know, the Hollywood is always trying to come up with some other way to kill a vampire other than just stick a stake in his heart. So anyway, uh, garlic, they don't like garlic, okay? Crucifixes, silver crucifixes, they don't like that. That's where they mixed religion into the vampire myth. When you mix religion into something, then it exponentially takes off as something that's, that's very interesting. Uh, they had a, uh, in the 1700s, a uh, kind of theologian wrote a book on vampires, okay? And everybody believed that he, he said they exist. And so here's a book written by a priest, okay, vampires must exist. And then he's the one of the people, one of the individuals who began the vampire hunting 
out into the, uh, the, the woods and the forests and stuff looking for vampires. Um, the sacred bullet, of course, the silver bullet will kill a vampire. The mirror, if you've noticed the original Dracula movie, Van Helsing shows him a mirror and uh, there's no reflection in the mirror. The vampire, you look in there, there's not, nothing there. You know why that is? Because the mirror is a symbol of soul, okay? And so if the vampire did not reflect into the mirror, that means the vampire had no soul. So that fit the, you know, the, the uh, religious mythology that they want to promote about vampires and stuff. Um, they also thought things like they could take a black dog and they could paint its eyes black and take it out there and scare the vampires away. I mean, the, the fiction writers came up with amazing stuff, unbelievable stuff to create the mythology of the vampire. Um, the vampire basically can control the air, earth, fire, and water. The vampire can master rats, owls, bats, moths, foxes, and wolves, the children of the night, that's what he called. That's what uh, Bela Lugosi called the, the wolves, the children of the night, that they were his friends, okay? He could also turn into a wolf. Um, so in many ways, uh, the vampire reflects uh, to a great extent um, the inability to explain things. I don't know if you understand what mythology is, but mythology is used to explain things that can't be explained by science, okay? And so if you look back through history, that's what mythology is. Now, a lot of you are sitting there saying, well, we have science now, we can explain everything. I will guarantee you this, I won't be around, you may not be around, but today's science is tomorrow's mythology. So if we think we know what the universe is about, we think we can explain all this stuff, it's not gonna happen. It's going to end up being a myth just like the past myths that existed throughout society. Um, the arch, the, 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 when you have, when you, and in fiction, when you have a character like Dracula, you have to create an opponent, right? So the opponent of, that, uh, of Dracula was somebody, which everybody I think knows, called Dr. Abraham von Helsing. Now he wasn't just an ordinary doctor. This guy was a metaphysician. He was a spiritualist. He dabbled in hypnotism. So he had extra powers. He had extra abilities. And so you need this other character that's going to fight the evil. And sometimes it's a priest and stuff, but generally speaking for Stoker, it was von Helsing, was the, the, the person that was going to fight the vampire. So again, I look forward to the fact that from now on out, we'll still have vampire shows, vampire movies. They'll all just be a little bit different. They won't be the same as in the past, okay? Let me close by saying a couple things. Um, when somebody came on here and said, uh, aliens don't exist, and then all, everybody here raised their hands, like they do exist. Everybody's hands went up. The answer to that is it depends where you look. If you look in science, you're not going to find it, okay? But if you look in what I call supernatural science, you're going to find it. There's plenty of books out there. There's plenty of other written materials that discuss not just aliens, but alien civilization. So I'll give you a few you can think about. Is there a civilization on Mars? Absolutely. But it's not at our vibration. It does not exist at the physical level vibration. Is there a civilization on Saturn? Absolutely. It's a black civilization of black people. But it, again, it exists on a different vibration. It doesn't exist on this vibration. Is there a civilization on Venus? Absolutely. Venus is one of the most ascended planets in the universe over thousands and thousands of years. In other words, it went from a physical existence, a physical universe, into another dimensional universe. And there's a very, very advanced society on Venus. Now, where is this information from? It's from different books you can read, different, different uh, chronologies you can read. So this stuff is out there. But a lot of times what you have, the problem you have is that science cannot prove these things. So if science can't prove it, it doesn't exist. That's, that was what 
uh, the call of Dracula was, of all about it. Just, and there's lines in this book that basically say that. If science doesn't prove it or can't find it, it doesn't exist. But if you look out through history, you'll find that that's not the case. So I'll leave everybody uh, with a little thought of watch out for those vampires around you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fraser. Any questions for Dr. Fraser before he goes? Thank you very much. Thank you. I, he cleared it all up for me. I, I, was, I knew there was something wrong with my ex-wife, and she's a vampire, so that's perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so next up, we have, from the Humanities Department, Dr. Jennifer Huntley-Smith. And she's going to give a little talk about Frankenstein, making our own monster. <laughs> oh my god, really? <laughs> how's, how's that? Maybe. Okay, so um, I can't decide if it's a good thing or a bad thing. Oh, look at you. Thank you so much. <laughs> I can't decide if it's a good thing or a bad thing that all the scientists have exited the room because um, I'm going to bring a different perspective to monsters. We've been hearing all about how science comes in with the light of reason and explains away all these monsters that exist. And I'm here from the humanities perspective to bring those monsters right on back, <laughs> right? What happens when science is the monster? That's the real question. All right, so my question today is, what happens or what is it about monsters that have something to teach us about actually being human? And I want to start, I have two monsters to talk about today. The first one, you've seen in a bunch of different formats. They always start this way, right? It was a dark and stormy night. Oh yeah. Even better. That's so cool. Yeah, so um, this is Frankenstein, as Frankenstein has been uh, turned into in popular culture over the 20th century. This kind of goofy, clumsy, ginormous guy who we refer to as a monster. And of course, the best and most awesome depiction of Frankenstein and his creation. He's beautiful. And he is mine. Hurry now. We're fighting time and the elements. Are you ready? Are you sure this is how they did it? Yes, yes. It's all written down in the notes. Now tie off the kites and hurry down as fast as you can. What's the hurry? There is a possibility of electrocution. Do you understand? I say there is a possibility of electrocution. Do you understand? I understand. I understand. Why are you shouting? Did you... Did you tie off the kites? Of course. Oh. All right, good. Uh, check the generator. Yes, master. Igor, release the safety valve on the main wheel. Yes, master. Can you imagine the brain of Hans Delbruck in this body? Oh, Frederick. This is the moment. Well, dear, are you ready? Yes, Doctor. Elevate me. Now? Right here? 
Yes, yes, raise the platform. Oh, the platform. Oh, that, yeah, yes. From that fateful day when stinking bits of slime first crawled from the sea and shouted to the cold stars, I am man. Our greatest dread has always been the knowledge of our own mortality. But tonight, we shall hurl the gauntlet of science into the frightful face of death itself. Tonight, we shall ascend into the heavens. We shall mock the earthquake. We shall command the thunders and penetrate into the very womb of impervious nature herself. When I give the word, throw the first switch. You've got it, master. chance I get. I just organized my whole educational career around opportunities to show Mel Brooks movies and um, Monty Python. So take your core humanities classes from me. Um, <clears throat> so, so this is a parody. This movie is a parody. All of the movie versions of Frankenstein, though, are really cheapened versions of the actual uh, story that Mary Shelley told about not a monster, but a creature. <clears throat> and Mary Shelley's creature, her, her book, uh, Frankenstein, was subtitled The Modern Prometheus. Any of you remember what the myth of Prometheus is about? Who was Prometheus? Anybody? Oh, come on, somebody knows. John, you know. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, Lucas, who's, who's Prometheus? Oh, he was a Titan that was, uh, that was included by Zeus, and, and I think every night an eagle would eat his liver out. Yeah, yeah, Prometheus was the guy who was chained to the rock, and he got his liver eaten out all every, every, night, every day, and then it healed overnight. But what was his crime? That's right. Prometheus committed the crime of taking, stealing fire from Mount Olympus and giving fire to humans. In other words, Prometheus is the agent for human advancement. All right. Now, humans have always been technological beings. That's one of the things we're Homo habilis. You know, I mean, that was one of the things that um, it made us have made us human from the beginning of evolution. I'm sure Christine would um, give me more precise uh, terminology there. But what Mary Shelley saw in her day, in the early 19th century, was the advancement or the, or the uh, dominance of technology to the point where it was threatening to divorce humans from their own human self. Uh, she, her creature is the product of what, I like to use horror movie terminology here, the, an, un, an unholy divorce of science from the humanities. 
I, as a professional historian and a professional teacher of the humanities, am constantly horrified by the fact that humanities in our society is seen as something sort of frivolous and old-fashioned and not really something necessary, and it's science and, and everything STEM-oriented, right? Science, technology, engineering, and math. That's what we need to have, right? And you, you cute little historians over there make things like lacy and cute around the corners. But what Mary Shelley is saying is, this is a very, very dangerous project that, that Frankenstein, Victor Frankenstein, was engaged in something that once he developed this technology of this creature, it was going to have very, very destructive force. He was unleashing a destructive force onto humanity, and once it got going, he could do nothing to stop it. Huh, what a crazy, crazy idea. A hundred and thirty six years later, I know you're just getting into it, right? Um, sorry, in the interest of time, I want to shorten this. But uh, Godzilla, this is a great Blue Oyster cult song, and you can find this on YouTube and rock out to it in your own home. But um, the, hundred, the connection here is that Godzilla was a movie that was the first, the first Godzilla movie was uh, produced in, in 1954 by Tojo Industries, which was a Japanese filmmaking corporation funded by the post-war American Marshall Plan. <laughs> and the first movie, although the later movies get goofier and goofier, the basic story of Godzilla is that this was a, a um, Tyrannosaurus Rex that was sleeping on the ocean floor that came to life because of what? What? Oil drilling, no, good guess. The nuclear testing in the Pacific, that's right. The, the American post-war nuclear testing that took place in the Pacific. The Japanese, of course, themselves had experienced the effects of nuclear testing, so to speak. They actually had two drums, bombs dropped on their society. So for them, the story of Godzilla actually, to us it's kind of goofy, but to them it actually had resonance. And if you watch that 1954 version with Raymond Burr, um, you'll see that it's, it's a little bit more serious than what we usually think of as Godzilla. Now the message behind the Japanese version of the story is that human beings unleashing technology without really thinking about it or without bringing a humanistic side to considering the effects of this technology can create enormous damage and long-term effects that may not be something that we can rein back in. So the Blue Oyster Cult lyric history shows again.
and again, how nature points up the folly of men, is actually a message we Nevadans might want to think about a little bit more seriously, since that nuclear testing did not just take place in the Pacific or on the Japanese people, but here in Nevada as well. And we um, continue to suffer the deleterious effects of that nuclear testing. Hey, I finally figured out the technology here. Um, so here we are, the state of Nevada, at one point in time, perfectly happy to celebrate nuclear testing in our desert. Um, you probably have heard stories about nuclear cocktails, about how the bouffant hairstyle was originally designed to mimic the mushroom cloud of a nuclear test site. Here we have you know, another tourist you could hang out in a Las Vegas um, casino and have your cocktail hour and see the bombs going off in the distant desert, but um, we also know today that uh, nuclear testing and other kinds of scientific testing have other kinds of effects on us aside from increasing our tourist potential. Um, and E.O. Wilson, who is a pol uh, Nobel Prize winning <coughs> biologist has started really asking us to take another look at science and to start um, considering whether just allowing science itself for the sake for the pure sake of science do we have to overthrow everything that makes us human and here's my plug for the humanities taken from the Nobel Prize winning scientist Casting his vote for existential conservatism. Let's pay attention to what it takes to make us human, he says. Let's work on preserving the biological human nature as a sacred trust. We are doing very well in science and technology. Let's agree to keep it up, move both along even faster, but let's promote the humanities. Rah, rah, humanities. <laughs> which, that which makes us human and not use science to mess around with the wellspring of this the absolute and unique potential of the human future. Mary Shelley, I think, would be very happy and also ask us, can we listen this time? That's it. Bravo. Excellent. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions? Yes. How much more awesome does it get to be in my class? Is that what you're going to ask for me? No. Um, so, <laughs> Dr. Huntleystein, um, do you do you think that the uh, the Terminator-like robot apocalypse is a thing that could actually happen? Oh, it already has happened. It's it's happening even now. I myself am a robot. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Huntley. Now. As we bring up uh, Professor Grin Navarro, I want you to think about something if science is out of control. I just heard a story on NPR that um, KFC was raided because they are creating chickens with four legs. More science turning monsters into the world. So think about that as we bring up Dr. Navarro. Hey, everybody. This microphone is really freaking me out. Um, so my name is Marina Aguirre Navarro. And um, you know what, guys? It's, it's kind of sad right here right now because we've been talking about uh, aliens not being real. We talked about uh, werewolf werewolves not being real. We talked about malaria spreading mosquitoes and then uh, Vampires and whatnot. Well, I'm going to put a um, smile on your face. I'm going to put a funny or a happy spin on it. Um, I'm going to bring you the good news, meaning we're all going to die. So that's, that doesn't matter. Um, the good news is that we can actually have some, some fun um, at the funeral. Uh, yeah, I guess we can. Um, let's see how. So first of all, right, you guys are laughing. That's funny, I said, because death is funny. Well, death is not really funny. Hmm, says who? Says the Western world. Um, meaning, in the Western world, in the United States, let's say when you think about the funeral, you become sad. Uh, the funeral, the 
dying is very sterile. You die, you are pronounced dead. Uh, and then immediately, let's just get this body. You're not even a person anymore. Um, let's get the body out of here. Let's put it somewhere else. Doesn't matter where, just not here, right? Because it doesn't belong here anymore. So we, we institutionalize the process of death, dying, and, um, and um, for a while. So um, it's also very scary. It's very enigmatic. Um, so let's take a look at other cultures, at other societies, and see if they also find it the same way. So when I was researching this, I found out one pretty reoccurring theme when it comes to funerals, and that is let's get as many people as possible to show up, right? How can we do that? Well, let's get some strippers, right? <laughs> That always uh, brings a crowd, uh, whether welcomed or not. Um, but some people, some guys, I should say, <laughs> it's not really a you know cross cross sex or cross gender kind of tradition. Um, but men actually put it sometimes in their last will to have strippers brought uh, to their funeral and to have holes drilled at the eye level of their coffins, <laughs> so they can enjoy it too. It's a, pretty, um, it's a pretty new tradition, uh, but embraced more and more in rural China, mainly, uh, to the point that even the government uh, has cracked down on it and made it illegal. You would think that it was illegal to begin with, but no. They just made it illegal. However, right now it's in the black market, so to speak. All righty, so um, enough of that. Let's take a look at some other, other traditions. So um, it sounds pretty funny, it sounds pretty fancy. It's called anthrop anthropophagy. Anthropophagy. Anybody heard of that? Uh, you did hear of that, but not this particular name. You heard it under the name of cannibalism, right? We all have heard of that. Well, there are two types of cannibalism. Uh, there is the endo and exo cannibalism. Anybody knows what endo or exo stand for? Endo meaning within the tribe, within the community. So people just eat one another, meaning uh, people eat their children, their grandparents, you name it. Uh, let's eat them. <laughs> um, why would people eat their relatives or why would why would anybody even consider eating somebody who, who's not only deceased, but, <laughs> but somewhat a family member? Crickets. So yeah, it's easy, meaning let's get their spirits circulating, right? Let's, you know, when we, like I said, we instit institutionalize death to the point that the moment somebody dies, let's get them out of here. Well, let's kind of reverse and let's get them in here, right? <laughs> So it's somewhat the opposite of what we're used to, uh, hence it might sound scary, but when you really think of it, our traditions are pretty scary because of that separation and, and not wanting to deal with death. Um, so yeah, people eat their relatives, uh, people eat their tribesmen to get their spirit to live forever inside of, of, of them, right? But then we also have exocannibalism. Any ideas? Sorry, I, I'm, not, I'm gonna skip that. So anyway, exocannibalism is a product of wa warfare, right? So you kill your enemy um, and you just go ahead to, um, to eating them because it gives you their strength, it gives you their power, right? So um, kind of a common reoccurring theme right there in order to, or you eat somebody to, preserve their spirit, to give their powers to you, whether, whether those are the good powers or the bad powers. All right. So um, probably at this point, you, I hope you're not getting hungry, but, um, <laughs> but if you are thinking about human flesh uh, and how does it taste, does it taste like chicken? It definitely goes well with the bottle of Chianti, as uh, you know, right? But I do have a quote from you, for you guys from William Bueller Seabrook, who uh, was an American lost generation occultist, explorer, and also cannibal, a cannibal. So there you go. It was like good, fully developed veal. Not young, but not yet beef. It was very definitely like that, and it was not like any other meat I have ever tasted. It was so nearly like good, fully developed veal, veal that I think no person with a palate of ordinary normal sensitiveness could distinguish it from veal. 
It was mild, good meat, with no other sharply defined or, har or highly characteristic taste, such as, for instance, goat, high game, and uh, pork have. The steak was slightly tough, tougher than prime veal, a little stringy, but not too tough or stringy to be agreeably edible. The roast, from which I cut and ate a central slice, was tender and in color, texture, smell, as well as taste, strengthened my certainty that of all the meats we habitually know, veal is one meat to which the meat, the human meat, is accurately comparable. So, just a kind of, uh, you know, next time you eat veal, <laughs> bon appetit. Finally, not finally, okay, so let's move to China, Mongolia, Bhutan, Nepal, and parts of India, where people, um, after, after the, their death, they, um, or they used the sky or celestial burials, um, and as you can see, the celestial burial, um, again, we're talking about the spirit, your spir spirit not dying with the body, but actually continuing the, continuing the journey. Um, the journey is continued through the birds, the, the birds of carrion, um, but it begins with actual people cutting. It's called the uh, body breakers. The body breakers come and start kind of the job for the birds. And guess what? They're actually laughing and just chatting during this procedure because it's supposed to help the spirit to move from one one part of the journey to the next part of the journey. So again, you know, to us it's gruesome, to, our, to us it's kind of scary, but when you think about it, again, it's our tradition that sh should be more scary, right? This is just a part of the journey. So there you go, the uh, body breakers are cutting the body open, cutting the skin open, preparing it for the birds. Sometimes in some regions where the, um, where the burials are not a daily occurrence, they have to actually fend the birds off with sticks because they are getting impatient. Um, it's bed omen if the body is not completely eaten, if there's not just, just the bones being left. Um, so, so sometimes the birds are even coaxed to, to the feast with, with the ceremonial dances. All right. Then we have Southern Indonesia. Okay, so in Southern Indonesia and in parts of Southern Indonesia, especially the Tana Taraha uh, funeral, Tana Taraha um, tribe, funeral is more of a celebration of life. And what a party it is. Uh, it lasts for years. After a person dies, he or she is not even called a dead person. It's just an asleep person or very ill per person. And they don't leave the house. They are getting embalmed and they stay in, stay in the house. What's more, um, they're still fed and dressed and washed, and, uh, which makes me think, thank God we don't have this here because in my household, there's always a, oh, who's gonna walk the dog? <laughs> well, who's gonna wash the grandma? <laughs> uh, right, there's no volunteers for, for this. So, um, so yeah, so it lasts sometimes for years. Uh, if we're talking about a poor family, that family takes, uh, it takes them some time to, to collect the money for the, bur for the burial. So uh, they keep the sleeping person at home, um, taking care of them. And then finally, when they have enough money, the funeral begins. The funeral begins with uh, gathering the bulls and pigs at a um, special ground where first they tackle them a little bit to show their strength. And then they slaughter the bulls, uh, the more bulls, the better, obviously. The more pigs, the better. Uh, then um, they take the they take the um, horns of the bull and they leave it at the house of the sleeping person to show the status, the social status of the person. Obviously, the richer you are, the, the, better, the better for you. The more horns are you going to have in front of your house. All right, so finally, after this is all done, the, the process of the, the, the burial ceremony begins. But is it really a burial? Well. Nope, let's make it even, even more exotic. So there you go, a burial place, the 
the bottom left corner, you see that there are um, coffins, wooden coffins hanging off of a cliff. Sometimes the bodies are also placed in uh, caves, the naturally occurring caves. Um, but also there is the effigy that's called Tao Tao. You see on the top picture, there are those figurines, those effigies, to represent the dead people. They are supposed to even look like the person who died. Um, but then the question, what is that tree on the right? Well, that tree on the right is for babies, especially babies who haven't had their teeth uh, come out yet before they, they died. Um, the babies are, are buried or the babies are put inside of the tree because it's believed that their essence feeds the tree later on and there, is, there can be mm, uh, dozens of, of babies um, buried in, inside of the tree. So, um, just when you think that this is done, well, let's clean the corpses. Uh, every seven years, um, it's, it happens in August, when the corpses are being retrieved from their place of burial, um, and they're being marched, they're being paraded across the village. As you can see, the paraders or the, the bodies, the corpses, can only be walked in straight lines because it's believed that the, 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 um, the, the divine creature who, who is responsible for, for dead people or the asleep um, can only walk in straight lines. So the moment you, you curve your, your route, you might lose a soul. Uh, these people were also, uh, in the past, very sca scared of traveling because they were afraid that if you die outside of your village of origin, your soul might not be rest to peace. Okay? All right. So uh, let's finish again on a strong uh, kind of a happy note. And let's get some fancy schmancy um, coffin, right? If, if the, the, the whole funeral ceremony didn't speak to you, um, you want to go traditional way, well, at least get a fancy uh, coffin from Ghana. Uh, you name it, they got it, right? So if you were into the, the, the funniest I read about, um, however, I couldn't find a picture of it, it was a, <laughs> it was, um, a coffin for a gynecologist. I don't know why I couldn't find a picture for it. <laughs> but yeah, he ordered it. Um, so anyway, whatever you're into, right, um, you can kind of mark it with your, um, with your coffin. I personally like the bottom one the most. I'm thinking about ordering one for myself. Uh, it definitely represents things or thing that I am into, especially with the Halloween coming. My daughters are both trained when the piñatas are coming down to fish the Twix for mommy. <laughs> <laughs> so, yep, that, that's how I'm going down. Um, and happy Halloween, guys, and bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions? Any questions? Yeah. The Indonesian ritual where they bring the corpses out every second. It was better without the microphone. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. Um, how, how long does that go on? Is it, is it seven Years. Seven okay, well, the, depends on what you're talking. When the person is still considered asleep and they're kept in the house, mummif not mummified, like em embalmed, that can last up to several years, depending on how rich the family is. However, the the... The moment they slaughter the, the bulls and the actual funeral begins, it's 11 days until the burial day. 11 days. Fantastic. Yep. What do you think are some contributing factors as to the diversions of why we have it as a somber ceremony and other countries celebrate the death? Business. <laughs> I think there is a good, there's good amount of money to be made off of and in the United States, in Western world, we do like to make money. So anything, um, uh, I'm checking Groupon on a daily basis just to see, <laughs> you know, maybe I could get a 50% off, you know. So I think it's, it's, a, it's pure business model. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. Take my class. Social Thank 101. Thank you.
Thank you for joining us for this year's Monster Panel. We should be back next year again. So join us again then. And have a safe holiday weekend.